I'm Coach Rack for Greg Olson's Youth Inc. Make sure to subscribe for more content like this. All right, man. Well, hey, so I, I remember the first time, and, it, and it's funny, I don't know if I put two and two together, but I remember your your big uh, viral moment the, back in 21 when you got signed by the Nationals and you go and surprise your dad at work. I don't know. And then all of a sudden, years later, you're everywhere on my Instagram feed and all my kids, every time I tell my kids something, they're like, yeah, that's what Coach Rack says. <laughs> and I'm like, who the hell is Coach Rack? <laughs> well, it didn't take me very long to find out who you were and then put it all together that it was the same story. So I, I want to even go back further than that. So I want to talk about that moment surprising your dad. I know the impact he had on you as just a coach and as a father, you know, as a father and everything and obviously everything you're doing now. But let's go back to where it started. Riverside, California, growing up, not a big baseball guy. In today's day and age, you started super late. Nine mm -hmm. years old is like starting right. at 30 <laughs> today. By nine in today's world, you got to decide what college you're going to. It's the only <laughs> sport you're able to play. Just ask everybody. But just g give us a sense of like where this journey really started before it all took place kind of in the, in the public eye. When I was four years old, I told my parents, I want to be an Olympic gymnast. Uh, when I was four years old, I said that because my sister did gymnastics and I thought, oh, that looks pretty cool. I want to yeah. do flips and stuff. So my parents were like, you have to wait till you're five. Then we'll, then we'll put you in gymnastics and you can do all that. So, uh, I started doing gymnastics when I was five and started doing it competitively. And I would watch VHS tapes of the Olympics that were, you know, recorded. I don't remember what Olympics that would have been, but I wanted to be an Olympic gymnast. And my parents were like, absolutely. I think you can do it. So we did gymnastics. We were going there multiple times a week. That was also part of the reason I was homeschooled. You know, gymnasts, they, they kind of oh, have to be true. homeschooled. We interviewed Sean Johnson for our You Think podcast <laughs> a year or two ago. And yeah. It's a different word. They think they think we're crazy with like summer baseball. If you're an Ol Olympic type sport, gymnastics, tennis, I don't care what those people, that's a different lifestyle. It is a lifestyle. It really, it consumes every part of your life. So no props to my parents for having my sister and I in gymnastics uh, for as long as we did it. Uh, when I was turning nine years old, we were already driving like 30 minutes a day to the gym and then 30 minutes back and there was always traffic. And, and then the gym that we were driving out to, they cut their men's program. Uh, I was eight turning nine and the, the men's program got cut. There was no longer really an option for me with gymnastics. And my dad was like, you know what? Uh, do you want to try another sport? And I actually said football. I used to play NCAA football 2005 yeah, on Xbox. Of course. Yeah. It's an iconic I mean, game. I loved football. That's what I wanted to play. And my mom wasn't you know, crazy about it. So my dad was like, you know what? Let's, let's try baseball. Like, so he drove me by Reed Park Little League um, in Riverside. And we stopped and watched a game. I knew nothing about baseball at all. But again, I did gymnastics for four years at this point. I was already a pretty good athlete. And uh, so, yeah, he signed me up. It was late for that spring, but I signed up, was able to play on the White Sox at Reed Park Little League. And that was my first year of baseball. And within about a month, I was like, all right, got a new dream. I'm going to play. I'm going to play professional baseball. That's that's now the goal. I just think so much of the backstory is so relevant to why you're able to connect with these kids today. Right. And I think you are so relatable. Right. It is so fun. It is not in your face. It is not. You're not so much telling kids what to do as much as you almost feel like you're along the journey with them. Like what about your background in sports? What about the people you've been around? I know you said your dad had a big impact. Other coaches like what about your journey has allowed you to have kind of this very fun, light, but also very educational, direct, instructional relationship now with this young generation through social and through these videos. Like, what is, where did that personality, where did that approach, is that how you played? Is that how you were coached when you were young? Yeah, I, it wasn't always how I was coached when I was young. And I think that's part of the, co the, the motivation behind a lot of the content I make is I want to make videos to coach my younger self. I want to be the coach that I wanted to have when I was younger. Which and is what? Give me an example. Yeah. An example of that would be I just struck out and I would get back to the dugout. I've had a lot of coaches that would be like, hey, man, that was a big situation. Like, can't really have that happen again, you know, uh, which I understand. At the same time, kind of what I needed to hear when I was a kid was like, hey, look like you chased a curveball in the dirt. What helped me when I was your age was like I was chasing everything down in the dirt. Uh, I, I would set my eyes up and I search for something up in the zone. And, and a lot of times that would help me avoid uh, swinging at that ball in the dirt. I think so much of baseball, yeah. because so much of baseball is uncontrollable. I think there's a lot of advice that's given by coaches, well-intentioned coaches. And the advice that they give 
uh, and uh, there's no real instruction there. They're just kind of narrating what's going on. Hey, you swung that curveball in the dirt. That can't yeah. happen. Yeah, the no kid sh- knows that, but no they don't shit. want to. Yeah. So they don't want to do it, but they don't know how to change. And so a lot of the the content that I make is like, okay, let, let's talk about some of those changes you actually can make because every failure in the book in baseball, I've done it. And I have little ways uh, that I've found that that can correct all these little things. So that, that's what I mean it's when a, I say I want to be cool. the coach I wish I had. When I come across some of your videos and I watch it, Yes, I do. You know, here's how you teach a backhand, the footwork at first base, whatever, like all the little details are really, but just the manner in which the delivery is something that I've, that's maybe not my greatest strong suit (laughs) and is something I'm conscious of. But I'm like, this is such a, it seems like such a positive way that these kids take it. So go back to where you're saying before. So like you're playing when you're young, maybe the coaches aren't giving you the coaching you would have liked in the moment, but like along that journey in the face of all that, how did you continue to progress? How did you continue to develop, not only physically to have the skill sets to be an All-American, play for the Nationals, now continue to play with the, with the banana, Savannah Bananas, but like, how did you continue to develop mentally? Like, how did you keep your confidence in those moments? Like, what about your journey, again, are we seeing come out in these videos that you make that millions of people consume on a daily basis? I think a lot of that drive to keep going and that mental strength, I think I attribute it a lot to my parents. Uh, a little bit of a, a look at what my parents were like growing up. Like my mom is the most incredibly positive, supportive uh, parent, uh, almost to where it would annoy me a little bit, you know, from time to time growing up because I, I would have a bad day at the plate. She was like, hey, no, but I saw you did this and you did really well in that. I'm like, all right, mom, I don't want to hear it. Like I, I yeah. suck today, you know? Um, but my mom was so over the top positive and always believed in any sort of ridiculous dreams or ideas that I had. It was like, oh, I want to be a professional baseball. I'm starting at starting at nine years old. I want to be a professional baseball player. And my mom's like, yeah, like you could totally do that. Like, keep going, like do it. Uh, and I was like, mom, yeah, like I want to get drafted straight out of high school. Like, I don't even, I don't even want to go to college. My mom's like, yeah, I mean, you can do it. I think you can do it. And so any sort of like, you know, crazy ideas that I had, my parents were like, yeah, like. Not I want to get pinch hit by a guy on stilts in front of 40,000 people <laughs> right. at Fenway Park, whatever. Like you can do like it, that. son. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so there was, you know, I felt, I always felt supported by my parents in that way. And not just in their words, it was like my dad would get off work at, at five 30, you know, from after working a full shift at Firestone and he would go throw me batting practice for two hours. And no one would do that unless you believe, Hey, like, I think my kid can, can really be something. And that's just through high school this is through college. So I think that belief that my parents had in me created like this deep rooted belief in myself. And I think that is what led to me persevering through a lot of different levels. I, I think if I didn't have that belief in myself, I, I would not have even played past high school. So. Yeah. What was your two hour batting session like with your father after he just got off a long shift at work <laughs> and he's probably just wants to go home and sit on the couch, but he's not. Was it confrontational? Was it super positive all the time? Was it a mixed bag? What? What was that part like? Again, my dad didn't play high level baseball or anything like that. He yeah. played like one year when he was younger, maybe some softball as he was an adult. So there wasn't hardly any instruction. It was, I'm going to throw you this ball and you're going to figure it out. So, okay. it, I mean, there's a beauty in that. <laughs> there is. There I is mean, a beauty in the It was unknown. like, well, we're going to let my body figure it out. I'll say one thing he did do is he, he you know, as a mechanic, he, he took these four tires and he bolted them together. I've, I've seen your seen video. video. Okay, I've yeah. seen your video. <laughs> so, but tell bolted, everyone who hasn't. Sure. Uh, my dad bolted these four tires together and I would just hit the heck out of them. Like uh, as you know, every single day I would go out the back and just, bah, or if I was ever mad about something, I'd go out and hit the tires. And, um, and I, I genuinely believe that's, that's where I developed a lot of my power. Uh, cause I think your body, uh, when it has an objective, like, Oh, I'm gonna hit these tires as hard as I can. And you're getting the immediate feedback of the bat bouncing back at you. If you're not pushing through them. Yeah. Um, your body is, you're smart, you know, your body figures out the optimal way to do things. And, and I think by giving myself that sort of objective and trying to hit those tires as hard as I could, I think that my body figured out how to organize itself in a way that, that, that uh, would generate more power than my frame should be able to generate. Yeah. That being said, I would hit the tires and then he'd go throw me BP and he wouldn't really say anything. Where is the line for parents watching this between everything your kid does is great and building that confidence and building that self-worth which is so valuable, especially in today's day and age, but like false hope, mm-hmm. false confidence, not yeah. being realistic. Like, do we tell them good job if it wasn't a good job? I think parents struggle with that. Like from mm-hmm. your experience, how did you filter through the love, the support of your mom, but also having the self-awareness, maybe when you got older, maybe this is more of like a high school conversation, but when you got older to go like, thanks mom, I appreciate your love and support, 
but I know I wasn't that good. Mm -hmm. It's a really difficult balance. And I think the key is that my, I know that my, I knew that my parents believed in the idea that if I, whatever I put my mind to, if I worked at it, that I would be, then I would be the best that I could be at that thing. Would I be good enough to make it to the big leagues? Who knows? knows? Right. There's so many factors there that you can't control. Uh, but I think what was key, though, is that when I would say, hey, I want to go take batting practice at the field, my dad was ready and available for me totally. to go take that batting practice. And what was often celebrated was not necessarily the successes in the game while those were celebrated. What was celebrated was, hey, we went out and worked every day. This Celebrate week. the work. Celebrate the work. Right. Because that's what you can control. No doubt. And so I felt very supported by my parents and that they would always celebrate the work that I was putting in and I would go hit the tires out back. They would never tell me to put any work in, but they would really celebrate it when I would put in extra work. And I think that made it so that I got excited about going and putting in the work. And that was the most rewarding thing for them to celebrate opposed to the actual success in the game, which you really can't control. Yeah. It's, it's so funny you say that because, and again, I don't probably always do it great, but like the common theme in our house is we coach, we're not going to coach effort. We're not going to coach being a good teammate. We're not going to slam our bat, throw a helmet. We see any of that. You're going to get your, you're, you're going to be in for an ass chewing. Mm -hmm. Now, you strike out, you don't have a great day, you struggle getting out of the first inning on the mound or whatever it is. Like our, the way I at least try to get it across to our kids is nothing we're doing, the work we're putting in this week is not to guarantee us a great weekend tournament. It's not to guarantee we make the middle school team next year. It's not to guarantee you're going to be the, the starting shortstop on your high school team. When you focus on the outcomes of it, now you're only stuck with the result. The result went your way awesome. The result was if not your way, I was a failure. Like we tried it to your point, exactly what you said is our words. Like we celebrate the work, mm -hmm. put in as much work as humanly possible. And if the ultimate goal doesn't work out, we're not celebrating that. Like the journey is the goal, mm -hmm. the journey, whether it ends in middle school, high school, or you play 10 years in the big leagues, it's not the point. If every kid's success or failure in any sport was I went to college for it or I made a living doing it. Every kid should quit playing sports today. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not going to work out for yeah. enough of them. Yeah. But you know, the day you stop playing your sport, I did everything in my power. My journey could not gone a day longer. That's success. The problem in today is that is not how we approach youth sports. Everything's yeah. about yeah. immediate. What all-star team did you make? What perfect game showcase you made? What team you were selected to? And I think it's exhausting for these kids. And it doesn't prepare them well for life either. No. Because in, in life, it's the same way. Sometimes you do everything the right way and you still don't win. You still don't succeed. That's it. And so that's the, the beautiful comparison between baseball and life. And, and again, that's where there's such a great opportunity and also such a great danger in youth sports because, uh, because there are those comparisons. Let's pick up that, that viral moment. My first time ever saying, I don't even know if you were coach rack at the time. You no, weren't coach rack at, at the time, No, but you were the kid who just got the call that your lifelong dream and your first reaction is to run down to dad who's on the job working. You have a camera following you. I remember watching it, not even knowing anything about you at the time as a dad, as a son, like I'm not sure if there's a cooler moment, whether you played 50 years in the big leagues or zero, it didn't at that point, you talk about the journey is this is the celebrate you won. Mm -hmm. It was a success. Like mm -hmm. talk us through that moment, walking in, having that moment with your dad, he's at work, blue collar, just that's the dream, right? Mm -hmm. That was such a special, special moment. And I didn't uh, even realize what that would turn into at all. I mean, <laughs> that video is the whole reason I, we're sitting like here now. hundred million, something like a hundred and something million the yeah. last time I looked. I mean, yeah. And, and that was crazy. I didn't have a social media presence at that point. I didn't intend to. It was, uh, that moment was so special for a lot of reasons. Uh, some of which we just talked about, you know, him throwing batting practice to me growing up and, and beyond that, you know, I was my previous year, my junior year, the best time for you to get signed out of college baseball. I uh, was COVID year. Yeah. It was five rounds. I wasn't going to be a first five round guy. And so that year I was starting to talk to scouts. I had a great season at Biola and, and before it got cut short following season, it's like, okay, I'm a senior now. I'm a position player. I'm at a division two school. There were a lot of things stacked against me. I didn't really have any conversations with scouts leading up to that. And so I knew it was a very long shot that I was going to get signed with a 20 round draft opposed to a 40 round draft. And so there was a lot of things stacked against me in that 
uh, scenario that I had talked through with my parents. I'm like, hey guys, like I, I really don't think it's going to work out. I don't, I'm, I don't really know what to do because this is what I've been preparing for. Right. And so that moment, you know, my name wasn't called in the draft, but I got a call right, right after to be a free agent sign. And uh, so right after getting that phone call, I was like, I know my dad's watching the draft tracker. I know he knows that I didn't get drafted. He definitely doesn't know that I just got signed. So I want to tell him in a special way. And that's where we drove down. I had my mom. I went to Lids. I bought a Nationals hat. I didn't have one. And, uh, <laughs> that's the best yeah, part of the story. Yeah. 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 <laughs> they had two Nationals hats left. I bought the last two at Lids. And everyone um, has these visions that like you have a box of every team in the right. league and the hat. And it's, yeah. Yeah. You're going no to the idea. mall. <laughs> yeah. I love that. Yeah. I went to the Tyler Mall in Riverside. And so we pull up and I'm like, all right, mom, like, make sure it's recording at the top. You know, yeah, you, know. You, you set it up. Make sure I, we, yeah. we all have moms. We love them. Yes, we do. Um, Camera pictures. Sometimes the challenge. Need a little coaching. I get it. I yeah. Get it. So she filmed the whole thing and, and, uh, I, I didn't think to post it till later in the day. I was like, oh, that was a cool moment. I'm going to post that yeah. on TikTok. And then, and then that was, that was the moment. But. And, and, and again, that moment is, I guess the birth of coach rack. I, I, I would imagine I would put words in your mouth, but from that moment on, your impact on you're everywhere. I, every time I go on my Instagram feed, granted now I follow you and have gotten to know you, but like even before that, from that moment of that viral video with your dad sharing your journey to where you are now, like living in the phones, the rooms, the minds of like all these young kids, all these heavily, like highly impressionable young kids. Like it's just incredible that you've been able to use your journey, your ups, your downs, your path, and now use it in a way where it's, it's so fun. It's so relatable. It's non-confrontational. You're not trying to be a clickbait guy. You're not trying to go out and make these hot takes and be controversial. You're just saying, hey, I have some really unique experiences. I'm going to do it in a really fun, lighthearted, got a great personality way. And these kids can't get enough of it. So, I mean, kudos to you, dude, because I see it in my household <laughs> on a daily basis. What you're doing for these kids it is making a significant impact. I, I, I see it with my own two boys, let alone the dozens of kids we come across that play with us. Well, thank you. Yeah. I appreciate you sharing that. The last thing I'm going to ask you before we wrap, like, what's the, fu like, where's the, what's the future of Coach Rack? Like, where, in your mind, you're, you're playing for the Savannah Bananas. You're going viral, running around with the American flag around second brace <laughs> after your home run. You're back flipping, catching the ball. Like, all these really cool moments that the world has now got to, like, kind of experience alongside with you. Like, where, what in your mind, where does it all go? Yeah, I think that, well, one, I want to be the most impactful youth, uh, voice in youth baseball. And so I think, and part of that is not just what I say, but also what I do and, and my, my story as a ball player. And I really want kids to uh, be taught the game in such a way that it makes them better human beings later on, because such, so few baseball players will end up being baseball players by vocation. So uh, because of that, I, I want I want kids and coaches to understand that baseball is not the end goal here. It's it's developing your character. No that's the end goal. And so I want to communicate that through educational content. I also want to be uh, a, a source of wholesome entertainment where parents can be like, hey, uh, you know, Feel free to watch Cotrax videos because, you know, it, whether you don't it's have to worry about anything. Right, right. Like, so I want to be a wholesome source of entertainment. I want to be an educational voice. And then beyond that, with my own own story, I feel privileged enough to have had, uh, you know, whatever level of successes I've had. There's millions, of, you know, maybe not millions, but thousands of other athletes who have had more success than I have in the, within the baseball sphere. Yet at the same time, uh, I have been able to over the past few years do something that I love to do and also find a new passion of mine through content. And I want other uh, kids out there to hear that story and take a look at their own life and be like, okay, what am I passionate about? What can I pour my heart into? Um, that other people might be able to find their passions and purpose yep. as well through my story. So that, that's kind of yeah, But goal. I think your story is the relatable story, right? That's what 99.9% .9 of the people going through sports, my, my kids, like you are their story. Like mm -hmm. just play the game because you love it. Learn to be the best you're capable of being, doing in a fun way, doing in a healthy way. Like, I think if you polled most parents, maybe not everyone in today's world, because some people are crazy, like, that's all I want through sports for my kids. I have no grand visions that my kids are going to be five star recruited athletes and be drafted number. I, I don't. Mm -hmm. That's not my vision for them. That's not why we get up and go practice and play. Like, 
So I think that is, I think your journey and your story is why it's so relatable because mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's the story for almost everybody. And that's the way it should be. Mm -hmm. Enjoy it for what it's worth. Well, I can tell you, man, we're happy to have you, uh, you know, as, as a partner and I, and what we're doing. And you think obviously your, your voice, your, your image, your message is, is a very much aligned with what we're building here at you think. And your willingness to, to be a part of this and from the ground floor on the way up to have you alongside and be able to use your name and your voice and, and, and your connection with these young kids. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a joy. It's been cool to get to meet you. And uh, I look forward to seeing what we're able to accomplish uh, both coach rack and everything you have going on. And then with what we're trying to build here at you think, I think there's a lot of cool uh, connections and a lot of over uh, kind of crossing points. And uh, we look forward to seeing where it goes, man. I appreciate your time. Yeah. Thank you so much, brother.